Telling me to not light? Yeah, why don't we give an intro first? I don't even know what the intro is. We're probably going to use the Cigar Dossier intro for this. What's up, YouTube? John and Jeff here John, with a Jeff. Jeff didn't Jeff mean. I'm John. To interrupt you. I know. That was rude. Yep. It's cool. I'm sorry Works about for me. that. Man, all the things I can't say all of a sudden. <laughs> Dang it! I'm glad that bus came by. It's true. <laughs> all right, no foley. So, Zach of Idea challenged both myself and Jeff on Instagram. To a 10 day movie screenshot challenge thing. You're not even supposed to explain it. I'm not on Instagram. This qualified. Jeff's not on Instagram. That's why he's not doing this on Instagram. And I'm not doing this on Instagram because I'm trying to keep my Instagram tailored for my photography. Yeah, it's so, for business. It's for business. Yeah. So we're doing it here. And because we both like YouTube a lot and Zach watches YouTube a lot, so. John told me to do it, and I always said, I actually said no, I think three times. Yeah, but Zach called you out. So, I'll call him out. Foot race, having a job contest, growing a hair out contest. <laughs> <laughs> Pass the kidney stones contest? Sorry about that, Zach. Just... Let's see who can hug your mom the longest. Oh. <laughs> All right, so really yet. we're going to roll this intro at some point, maybe here. Maybe, maybe not. He's editing this. We're going to roll it in post. Oh, sorry. No. Oh, this is going up live Wednesday. Not live, but you know. It's got to be up Wednesday. I'll have gas then. To get here to edit. Dang. <laughs> so as per our standard, we're going to be smoking a cigar because I felt gypped from the cigar earlier also. The uh, punch is so good. The Diablo, what was up with that? Man, it's just like... It turned into chewing tobacco in my hand. Like, it just crumbled. It was so bad. I was hot and tight. These are Alec Bradley's seconds. They were extraordinarily cheap, so we bought a bunch. Surprising. They're okay. So who's going to start this off? Dude, I'll go because I have a childhood movie up first. And I put my list together so fast. It's just, it's hard to, like, when I was done, I realized I didn't have a single Batman movie in here which was heartbreaking, and I've already forgot the other classification of movie that I wanted to put in here. <laughs> I was standing over there. Batman and Mr. Freeze is a classic. It's not on this list. I picked a different childhood movie, but the, 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 the Mr. Freeze performance in that, it was, it, was, it was surprisingly high drama for a Batman animated movie. But I had, I had Toy Story for influential childhood movies. Not necessarily childhood as the category, but yeah, Randy Newman, uh, Tim Allen before he got super weird. Tom Hanks, back when I loved Tom Hanks so much. Was that before the uh, Castaway movie? Um, first of all, Castaway is a classic. I did fall asleep on that viewing. You don't take a 10-year-old to see Castaway. You don't get it. It kind of ruined Tom Hanks for me. I'll bring him back when I voice over Wilson. <laughs> I have more respect for the Castaway film. Go back and watch that plane crash in Castaway. This is about Toy Story, though. I had toys growing up, and I had parents. I think that's the basic formula of loving a Disney movie. It's probably what what movie did your parents play while they were trying to ignore the fact that you existed. And when the video games ran out, I watched Toy Story. That was uh, that was my Shrek. All right. I don't really have much to elaborate on that. Friendship. I didn't have friends growing up in my early age because I smelled bad. Just take a shower. My mom had depression. She didn't always clean us best before the divorce. Hi, Mom. I love you. It's fair. All right. So my, uh, I don't know if I should do these in order of, of what I think they should go in or just alphabetical order like I wrote them down. Mine is no particular order. Mine's not even alphabetical. Mine is, I vomited this. I had to scratch off a few. Okay. Well, I'll start from uh, alphabetical order then. I tried to hit every genre but rom-com. My, my first movie on my list is Into the Dragon with Bruce Lee because 
me and my dad watched that movie a hundred times, and then later on, it was just like this movie as a young child, like eight to ten years old, that I would watch by myself a lot. Not because I wanted to be Bruce Lee, but because the movie was awesome as a kid. How many people did you fight when you saw that movie? I don't think I fought anybody because of that movie. How many tea bags do you have in that cup? So I started the day with a cup that had no tea bags in it. And <laughs> I'd, I'd usually drink two tea bags when I make a tea. And if I'm going to reuse the cup, I throw another tea bag in there. And then I've also put two tea bags in before we started this. Because Mountain Dew, when you drink soda and smoke a cigar, it's, it smells like you have an ashtray in your soda. It's true. But the more important question is, how much dairy have I had? You Not and that good. pumpkin spice. Not good. <laughs> you and that pumpkin spice. That's why I don't have gas Wednesday. We are recording this Sunday night. It is Sunday night. It is. Crazy. Me? Matrix, man. Matrix has to be on there. Who did not love the Matrix growing up? Man, the only reason it didn't make my list is because I literally did not get to it in the list of movies that I was researching through to remember the movies I saw as a child. I let you have one that I, I would have put on this list, but I, I bumped it off for another uh, to give a, a director too much space on this list. Yeah, the 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 Matrix, man, Kung Fu all over the place, crazy CG, never seen camera, nobody has seen camera effects like that before. Bullet time was new, and as a kid, when your favorite action movie was Die Hard, and then you see combat taken to a whole new level, that was that was mind blowing. And sci-fi was a real big to me, was a real big deal to me when I was a little, little kid. Oh, yeah. Before I found the sci-fi channel. Oh, yeah. And I realized what they were doing to that genre. Um, I didn't appreciate pulp science back then. But it's got every trope in storytelling. It's got the trickster, it's got the hero, it's got the mastering of both the worlds. Um, it's basically the Bible of Kung Fu, which, like, you know, follows the Bible arc very, very specifically. I would say, specifically now... As somebody who pursues cinematography, at least as a hobby, that, that bullet time specifically, we've talked about this buying a bunch of GoPros to do it. Yeah. Sort of like Devin Graham, the punk, did it before me. But, yeah. We've no. had thousands of dollars first. Sure. Graham. But, yeah, no, bullet time is definitely an impactful moment for me, or part of that movie. And high concept sci-fi was like, other than what I was finding in video games, was expanding my mind as a storyteller of what was possible and how boring the things around me were, and how I didn't really have to pay attention to not liking my childhood much. And oh. the, the idea that people were uploaded into computers and there was a virtual reality nobody was aware of was fantastic. The only flaw in the plot was the Wachowski's original vision for it was that the, uh, the the robots were going to be using human brains as supercomputers, and that's why they were keeping them in pods. Super processors for the supercomputer running the Matrix. A producer didn't understand processing technology at the time because Intel's marketing game was too weak, I guess. They didn't hear the Weird Al Pinium video. Um, oh, such slackers. I know, lazy producers. So they were just like, hey, we got this sick Duracell sponsorship, and that's why you have Morpheus. Boom. It's a Duracell. People are batteries now. Even though they could not possibly produce more energy than you could feed them and cause producing food to feed them. Totally Done concept. Fair. Ruins the whole matrix. <coughs> People are supercomputers. People are not batteries. True. So my number two movie list, moot movie, screenshot from my, that's impacted my life, is The Good, Bad, and the Ugly with uh, Clint Eastwood. And this is one of those movies also that my dad and I watched a bunch. And th this is a recurring theme throughout my, my list here. Your uh, father. Well, yeah, my dad. My dad and I watched these movies together. But also because they were sort of the idea of what you should grow up to be, like this type of person. You know, you should grow up to be the kind of person that Clint Eastwood portrayed in that movie or that some of my other movie characters have in common. That's interesting, that we're different people, mm -hmm. and I feel like Tom Hanks had more movies showing me the depth of a masculine role growing up than any Western. And I'd probably be a different person if I grew up on John Wayne, but I've, I've seen uh, Tom Hanks be a man more often. 
Well, that's fair. Probably explains this motion. There's a John Wayne movie in my list here, too, yes. which is also for the same reason. But No, that's Good, Bad, and the Ugly. Uh, on top of being something that my dad would have pressed on me, like this is the idea of what being a man should be like, sort of. Uh, also, I used to be a really huge Metallica nut job, like just a big Metallica fan. And they always played the Ecstasy of Gold at the beginning of all their concerts. I don't know how you could do that and in the 90s when they looked like a boy band. They were definitely not a boy band. They are now. St. Yeah, Anger man. turned them into a boy band. I don't know, man. I feel like Nothing Else Matters was kind of getting them close. That was kind of, yeah. That was right there on singles. the cusp. You know, like Sanitarium and... The hair flip. Will they sing that song? <laughs> Creeping Death. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, the good stuff, anyway. The Thrash, man. That's they were my, uh, big on the thrash, and they did some pretty awesome thrash. It's true. Well, that's my number two, the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, number three is kind of a left field. Maybe not all of you guys have seen it. Dragonheart. I have seen that movie. It was a fantasy action movie with a guy I can never remember the name of, but most importantly, it had a really dope CG dragon. Yes, it did. And that was an example of manliness because uh, watching King Arthur stories and things like that and classic medieval literature adapted to movies it did bring up knights of the old code and chivalry and what that meant as far as being uh having integrity and loyalty and sticking up for the weak and being dope with a sword and i thought being dope was with a sword was important until i was 17 and even to this day i can do some pretty neat lightsaber tricks if we ever needed to have an unchoreographed sing single person with lightsabers uh, twirling shits around see man i just get beeped <laughs> Yep. Yeah. You have to beep yourself, yep. So that that makes me oh man, there's so many movies I couldn't add to this list and I guess I can't add that one now, it's too late. Yeah, me too. Dragons. And it was such a good movie, the spoilers. A dragon dies at the end. The dragon was a friend. It was misunderstood and compassionate. It was a really good movie. Uh, I remember so, it being a really good movie. It's right up there with that Merlin miniseries, which isn't on here because that was a miniseries, despite it releasing as a movie on VHS, which is how I saw it. That was my number three. I actually had to uh, bump off a Mel Gibson movie to put it there, which I feel was worth it. I don't think I have a single Mel Gibson movie on No, I don't. I have a single Mel Gibson movie on my list. It's hard actually. not to pick some Mel Gibson movies, man. He did some important work in the day. Something I mean, that I was too young for. I was never too young for Braveheart. As an actor and a director, I think Mel Gibson is phenomenal. Maybe not as a person, but I don't really know who he is as a person all that well. He's Murtaugh. So my number three movie uh, uh, that has impacted my life is The Goonies. And that's because, specifically as a child, you always want to go on a treasure hunt, man. You got like a group of friends. You always want to do some, have some big, massive adventure. And that always drove... Like, that movie specifically, as a child, I can remember making me want to go out and take 30 Nerf guns and go round up all the guys and, like, run into the woods across the street from my grandma's house and just Nerf gun fight until we passed out. I or water gun fight or something like that. I left Goonies off my list because I saw that you had it on yours. And it wasn't super important to me, but it was filmed in my dad's hometown near Eugene, Oregon. That's where my daughter lives now. Yeah. Well, just outside of Eugene. It was, uh... It was pretty impactful growing up for me, too. I got out of a speeding ticket because I was wearing my Goonies shirt, and that was my peak of sex appeal in high school, was that faux vintage Goonies shirt that Target was making. Similar to the sex appeal this man has now? I have two DVD copies of Goonies. Those uh, Hawaiian it's, shirts? It's pretty, it's pretty red, you know? I mean, you can truffle shuffle in that shirt, for sure. It's true. Take off my other shirt and give it a flap. <laughs> 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 I didn't mean to cut off your commentary. <laughs> no, it's good. We're good. <laughs> My commentary would all just have to be cut out of the video anyway. Uh, I had to scratch this off. Like, I went back and forth between Starship Troopers and 12 Monkeys for my major sci-fi film. But I'm sticking with 12 Monkeys. I know there's a lot of Starship Troopers fans out there. It's just like, there's no way that wasn't the dopest movie when you were a kid. But my stepdad was a big Oscar fan of movies and he had Terry Gilliam movies and he showed me uh, 12 Monkeys. I was a huge Bruce Willis fan when I was younger, back before he became a turd. Um, and that just 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 the the idea of, of him coming back in time travel to be locked into a purpose that he ne didn't necessarily want to deal with and then seeing Brad Pitt's really stellar performance 
and 12 Monkeys. Just It was hard not to watch Brad Pitt and 12 Monkeys. I would probably put that above his performance in Fight Club as far as just infectious to watch psychopaths. I've never seen that movie. Oh, you'd love it. That, it's been it burned in my mind, and it took me years to find it again because I couldn't figure out the scene at the end. And it, it kind of bookends the film. The dude's walking through an airport, and a single vial falls on the floor, and it gets shattered. And I didn't really know what was going on when I saw it the first time because I was too young. But I knew that that meant that everybody was going to die. And that's why Bruce Willis went back. It was, it was so clear Terry Gilliam was putting together just a simple, this is a vial in an airport. A child can understand that this vial is something. I mean, I think, I think it wound up being anthrax or something like that. Crazy. Weaponized diseases. Crazy. 12 Monkeys is dope. You need to see 12 Monkeys. It's one of the best time travel films. That is not crazy sci-fi. All right. Movie number four on my list is Hocus Pocus, the extremely silly Halloween movie. You and my sister, man. This movie only makes my list, like, not because I don't love the movie and because the one witch sister is super hot, but... One of them. Sarah Jessica Parker is a foot. The reason this movie makes my list is specifically because it's my mom's favorite movie, and no matter how old I get or where I'm at, if for some reason I want to remember my mother in that moment, like I'll watch Hocus Pocus and it just reminds me of my mom. It is way more of a classic than I gave it credit for coming back to it when I was older, and Sarah Jessica Parker has been hot for 30 minutes in her entire life. Yep. It was in that witch's dress. Yep. It's true. Respect. I don't hate it anymore. Halloween Town, for that matter, should have been on here. Think of how much I hated my sister growing up, and she did nothing wrong. Uh, Jessica, I think you're a delightful oh, that's, young lady. That's, that's, uh, that's Alicia. Oh, I don't know you, Alicia. I'm she sorry. She abused the Halloween Town stuff. She was the abuser of movies. That's why I know the whole Grease soundtrack. All right. Dogma was a hugely important. It was my first Kevin Smith film, but more important than that, it's a movie that my brothers snuck into the house and we weren't allowed to watch. It was, a re it was a religious enough household that we were banned from watching Little Mermaid. There was some kerfuffle over Harry Potter for a little bit. The first time that my parents saw a King of the Hill episode, it was banned from the house. And then later they saw it and said, this is wholesome. And then I found it on the TV and I was like, this is the crap. <laughs> Can we throw this back in your face, Dad? Uh, but just, just seeing, see, seeing religion displayed comically... Seeing characters that I really identified with as someone who was always growing up goofy, just having the idea of Jay and Silent Bob running around, being goofy got me uh, got 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 me attention at some times when I wanted it and when I didn't want it, but it never really got me into friend groups. It just kind of became like you know, you go to some you you pay a comedian for 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 jokes and then you leave the show. You don't get to pay you for jokes on Fiverr. No, because Fiverr has my account pending for review again. <laughs> and apparently they don't work on weekends. Man. Kevin Smith later became one of the most important filmmakers to me, so Dogma had to be on the list. It's a really good one. I haven't seen it in a long time. But I do find that the age difference here is kind of cracking me up as to what childhood movies you saw versus what childhood movies I saw. 80s and 90s. Yeah. It's a clear distinction. Oh, yeah. Movie number five on my list of movies that have impacted my life is Home Alone. I Only because I remember watching that movie so many times and just like... I, okay, so my sister is a good bit younger than me and I quickly had to become the older brother who stayed at home to babysit when the parents were out of the house and I always had these like daydreams of somebody breaking into my house and just having crap everywhere set up to trap them. You know, take care of the household, whatever, not being afraid of stuff. Just, that and I lived in Lawton, so like the scene where they had the, the firecrackers in the can in the bathroom or whatever, and the uncle was yeah. being recorded singing or whatever. It's just Lawton, man. Just every day, drive-bys. <laughs> just, you hear that so often, you don't even jump anymore. You're just like, oh. So yeah, that's my that's my number five. I lived in that neighborhood, and I heard that all the time. Home Alone, yeah. I grew up in a scary neighborhood, too, and Home Alone was kind of a thing. I played it on Sega. Did you play it on Sega? I did, yeah. That was the, a dope game. 
The worst part of that is we both grew up in terrible neighborhoods, and Home Alone is set in a fantastically expensive, rich neighborhood. That's true, but they had a two-story house, and uh, we had found, well, my stepmom and her second husband had found a foreclosed two-story house that had been basically gutted, and they rebuilt it. So we had, like, one of the nice houses on the block in a bad neighborhood, so... One of my brother's first time staying home sick after he was 12 and nobody needed to stay home with him. Uh, there were people casing the house and he went and tapped on the window with a butcher's knife and scared him away. <laughs> home Alone was real, man. Dell City is a rough neighborhood. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just, I, don't, I sandwiched them all together. It was probably a bad idea. Clerks, another Kevin Smith film. I wanted to make this exclusively a list of Kevin Smith and uh, Edgar Wright films, but Clerks was, I got that movie out of my dogma fandom uh early pirating days once i showed a real interest in dogma my brothers had also pirated some other kevin smith films including clerks which they didn't like because it was black and white but i liked because it was vulgar and it starred characters that were disproportionately articulate to the world around them they, they all talked like they had phds in english and i was a very articulate child and i just kind of connected with that vulgar humor and dejectedness and I don't know it made me feel grown up to see that movie and then later as I was becoming a filmmaker and I got more familiar with the story of Kevin Smith dropping out of film school taking his tuition money back running the gas station the, the, the quick stop he actually worked at the quick stop and shot at nights after work he had the owner's permission but during the day he would take calls from credit card companies and say I'm Kevin Smith I own the quick stop I make fifty thousand dollars a year and he uh, which he did not <laughs> And he took all those credit cards and uh, took on a bunch of credit card debt to make $30,000 so that he could fund the filming of Clerks. That was one of the, mm, the most irresponsible ways the big three independent filmmakers made their nut to make their first films. Robert Rodriguez made $7,000 selling his body to NASA and other science projects. T Quentin Tarantino had a baller script that Harvey Keitel basically funded a million dollars for and Kevin Smith took on an enormous amount of credit card debt and dropped out of college. And made it happen. Made it happen. Clerks. Sorry. Motto of the story, take out a bunch of credit card debt and make a movie. Yeah, make sure that you have Scott Mosier and David Klein. Let two of your friends finish film school so they know how to make a film. And you sit at home and write one. There you go. Number six on my list. Is that number six? That is number six. Number six on my list of the movies that have impacted my life is Office Space. Um, Meat. Oh my gosh, dude. Working for the school district was about as ridiculous as that movie. Not, I mean, the movie is, for me, literally my favorite movie. It's hilarious. It portrays everything that I can remember as, as a computer technician. Like, all the hilarity, all the shenanigans, all the stupid crap. It's not that I'm lazy, it's just that I don't care. I feel that now. I mean, yeah. That's just the whole movie, though, man. It's like, that movie encompasses basically every little bit of my time at the school district. Did you go to lunch and hit on the waitress? Occasionally. I did that every day at school. I didn't have a waitress, because one wasn't doing that money, but... Anytime that we had a chance to go some other place to eat that had a drive through girl. <laughs> well, see, Chad and I would oftentimes go to the Branding Iron or Rise and Shine. Rise and Shine was this 3 a.m. to like 1 p.m. restaurant, like a breakfast place. Yeah. We'd always have some random waitress, and there was always some super random shenanigan that went on in there. Well, for once, or one time, we had a guy come in while we were eating, and he put little beaded bracelets on everybody's table. And like you just walk around and put one on every table. And they all had a tag on them that said, I'm deaf, please donate $5 and help me, whatever. And <laughs> Chad, like the guy puts it on our table and turns and walks away, yeah. Chad goes, hey, I don't want this bracelet. So the guy turns around and goes back and grabs it. It was just the shenanigans, so. Who hasn't falsified a charity? Oh, well, well, let me, uh... <laughs> I used to hold up signs at Mardi Gras when I lived in Biloxi <laughs> that said we were taking candy to children, and we did not. Um, <laughs> my, my friend Rob was out sick for two weeks at school, 
and he had shaved his head bald just before he left because, you know, too poor for haircuts to shave your hair bald, your head bald. Uh, so I told a lot of people that he had cancer. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I collected that money. <laughs> anytime somebody got away from a vending machine, I had, I had like a tin, like, cookie jar, like a Danish cookie thing, and I would take their change. I made like a solid 30 bucks. This and is how we yeah. fund our next movie. We, I think we got a copy of Medal of Honor with it. <laughs> <laughs> so it went, it went to me and Rob eventually. I just didn't tell him I was profiting. And a lot of people were mad. And then I said, no refunds, where's your receipt? I had more fun telling people they weren't getting their change back. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Clerks 2. Why not? <laughs> I thought about switching up the order for surprise, but let's just get him out of the way, man. Clark, uh, Kevin Smith is one of the most important filmmakers to me, above Tarantino and Rodriguez, and uh, probably even Edgar Wright, just as far as emotional connection. And But Clerks 2, when Clerks 2 came out, I think when I was in high school, and uh, by that time that I had adopted Rob as my silent Rob, and then I was Jeff, my name started with J, and I was the most vulgar. <laughs> and I had, we both had the long hair. We used to watch that movie all the time. Uh, it was, it's always weird seeing Jay and Silent Bob next to Randall and Clerk, even though, or Randall and Dante and Randall, even though, you know, that's the whole crux of the Clerks is the four, because it's just hard to, hard for me and Rob and then the friend group around us who keep trying to cast us in that movie, Who Are We? Just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, to, 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 save, to save a point, when Dante and Randall decided they were going to leave movie movies and open the quick stop and just own it, after it caught fire, I did cry. I did see a lot of vulnerability between me and Randall. And Clerks franchise, one of the biggest franchises growing up. Just I can't, I would like Randall to Jeff, whatever. There's a, a Jeff actually plays Randall to just go ahead and agree to be in Clerks three because that's the whole of it right now. He doesn't want Jeff Anderson doesn't want to play Randall again. Man, but Clerks three is that close. I know. <clears throat> All right, movie number seven on my list of movies that have impacted me growing up. This is where we hit the John Wayne movie, Rio Bravo. And I picked this one specifically. I've never heard of that one. Despite the fact that, that we've, oh man, me and my dad have watched probably every single John Wayne movie. And they could all make this list just the same. It's John Wayne. Uh, like the epitome of how a masculine guy should be when they're you know, grown up. Yeah, and Genghis Khan. I mean, you know, Genghis Khan. <laughs> but I picked Rio Bravo specifically because one of my favorite non-John Wayne characters, actually two of my favorite non-John Wayne characters that are in a John Wayne movie, are, are they're both in this movie. The guy who plays Colorado and the guy who plays Stumpy. Stumpy is hilarious. He's this old man. And at the end of the movie, I'm, I'm like 90% sure this is correct. Or it's this movie. But at the end of the movie, he's throwing sticks of, sticks of dynamite at this house. And John Wayne is shooting him out of the air with a with a 30-30 lever action rifle. Just That's hella baller. It's everything about that movie. Uh, Colorado's such a horrible shot that John Wayne makes him give up his pistol and gets him a sawed-off shotgun as a sidearm. And miss. <laughs> oh, he did. Well, he, he kind of missed. He, the, he was chasing this guy down the road and... He, like, pulls out his sawed-off shotgun to shoot at the guy, and it's, like, super short. I mean, it's, like, it's, like, shells hanging out the end of the barrel short. He could run away from him. Oh, he was about ten feet in front of him, and he barely clipped him. He blew the sign off of a building, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, it's also, you know, a movie that's a testament to your friends who are willing to make you eat gunpowder when you're an alcoholic. That's not a remedy. <laughs> Where's it that? All, you we could cure a lot of my alcohol issues with a solid bedtime. <laughs> it's not how much I drink, it's that I'm drunk at 3 a.m. <laughs> it's fair. That's funny. I'm not going to make you eat gunpowder. Well, that would be hilarious. It would not cure anything. It makes you throw up and get sick to your stomach every time you get near it. Cool, I'm clean. Let's start over. <laughs> Let's get a new bottle. Oh, it'll, it'll take a while. It took him like a week to get over in that movie. I'm not doing it. I had to put an Edgar Wright film on here, and I wish that it was 20 movies so I could just have all the Edgar Wright movies on here, but Hot Fuzz, it, was, uh, the, it wasn't the first. Obviously, I saw Shaun of the Dead first, but it has been the one that I watched the most. I still have a copy that I stole from Rob uh, when I moved, 
He didn't say I could have it. He let me borrow it once, and I left the state with it. And you're never going to get it back. Uh, get that digital. It's not hard anymore. It's probably still on Netflix. But it was the perfect balance of, of buddy comedy and humor and action. And just the, the jokes in it were super sharp. It was like one of the first times that comedy was really displayed to me visually. That was not like a vaudeville thing or really sticky or a rerun of, of The Stooges. Just the, the editing in Edgar Wright's comedy sells the joke. And it wasn't, it was kind of pre YouTube. Uh, there was a lot of goofy stuff like that on the internet with flash animations, but nobody had really done it on a, like a professional cinema level like Edgar Wright had. And he, Edgar Wright will go on to today to be like one of the most important directors to me as far as comedy. Well, not even just comedy, just stylistically. He's, he's one of the best directors in the game right now, and Marvel fired him from Ant-Man because they are fools. And I hope you direct a DC film. You deserve it. You're the best director in the game right now. <clears throat> it's fair. Baby Driver was fantastic. Yeah, I did leave that off in here, as well as Scott Pilgrim, but it's two of the best films. So, my eighth movie in my list of movies that have impacted my life, uh, and because we're going in alphabetical order, I'd have probably put these in I'm a completely not. different... <laughs> I'm going in alphabetical order. He's going in Jeff alphabetical order. Uh... They would have been completely rearranged a lot, I'm sure. But Saving Private Ryan. And specifically, this movie uh, impacted my life because of all the marksmanship competitions and things I did. And uh, it, it's something that I kind of remember my grandfather by because he was in World War II. And I, when I was taking care of him late in life, he... Um, he made me watch a lot of World War II movies with him, and so this was one that I could get away with, and it was like, a baller this one. is a good movie. Um, but the scene where the sniper shoots the other sniper through the scope in the eyeball, uh, that's a trope that's been done a bunch of times. The first time I read about it was in a biography, and I can't remember the name of it, or the guy who wrote it. Now. Well, you're not really a booksman. I'm, I'm really not. But uh, it actually, like, the guy who actually did that. He's real. He's a real guy. It was in World War II, I believe, or maybe Vietnam. I can't remember. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's probably... The, the story is so old, it's probably happened as long as there's been scopes. It's true. It's the split the arrow of guns. Well, it's uh, also a reflecty thing you can see a long way off. Yeah. If the light hits it just right. Uh, but yeah, no. Like, through high school doing ROTC and even outside of high school shooting, like, high-power NRA matches and stuff, to aspire to be that good at shooting anything. We shot paper, but uh, it was always like high on the list of important things to me. Then growing up having a gun range and being around guns all the time. I don't know. It was it's around just, guns seasonally. We ain't, we ain't had no sniper rifles. Never used a scope. It was always iron sights. That's uh, sighting a scope is a pain in itself. Yeah, I'm not a fan it's of them. Art. It's cheating. It's if you really guys hard. use scopes, you're cheating. It is really hard to sight a scope. <laughs> Get out there, shoot a thousand yard open sight competition, well, and do well, and then call me tomorrow. It's really hard to sight a scope if you don't know what you're doing. Currently today, it still takes my dad an entire day to sight a scope. But he's had a couple of friends over and sight a scope in three shots. So, you know, just get on YouTube, look at some tutorials. Saving Private Ryan was a big deal for me growing up too because it was my favorite war film. It did start a fight in my family, and this would come up a lot, is I would make a joke about something, and normally they're all about jokes until it comes up to religion, mm -hmm. and in this case, weirdly enough, the military, because everybody was... I mean, it's a big pro-military family, don't get me wrong. It's one of the reasons why I love war films so much. Uh, you know, we always supported the troops and whatnot. Independence Day was is my stepmom's and basically my, fav my family's favorite movie. You know, it's not really a war film, but... Yeah, I was really really going hard at the special effects of the guts and just like being absolutely adamant that is Laffy Taffy. Oh yeah. And they were super, super not having it. They were just like, don't disrespect the troops in the house. Your brother's going to Afghanistan in a month. And that's true. My brother was enlisted. He left me my copy of Ocarina of Time. But I wasn't just slighting anybody. Special effects was goofy. I didn't call that stuff out. I thought special effects to Saber Private Ryan were pretty spectacular. Oh yeah. 
But the, I, the, the guts were lacking. Time. The opening Omaha Beach scene was just, oh man. I shouldn't call the special effects and save them Private Ryan Goofy because I'll, somebody will shoot me from a window. Because they were sure. great, but you know, the, the gut stuck out to me. That was taffy, bro. It was, it was taffy and fake blood. Um, another Tom Hanks movie that was really big for me growing up was Forrest Gump. And I, I couldn't wish put it that on my list. Why? I don't, I don't know. Just couldn't do it. It's hard, and I looked at it and I was like, it's cheesy to have this on anybody's top list. And Tom Hanks is a dead meme. But I, mean, I watched it. You made I, my list. I watched it like once or twice a week, like growing up. And it, it, I wanted to watch it with my mom because my mom's side of the family it, are just compulsive big fish tellers. That's why she got along with Mia so well. But they're both liars. <laughs> <laughs> Mia, I love you. Liar. But uh, I'm not lying. Yeah, I mean, even even today, we're just still. Just, just the way that, that Forrest Gump went through history and was always just a convenient part of it and retelling American history through your own perspective and just injecting yourself there was, it was like a really cool creative exercise to see on, see on TV mostly, but uh, my, my family did that a lot and allegedly we're still poorly connected to the Dixie Mafia, not that I'm afraid of a single Delancey on the planet, don't find me, but... <laughs> well, a name like Delancey. I don't care. <laughs> Who runs more, Forrest Gump or Casey Neistat? Uh, pfft. look at their bodies and tell me. <laughs> it's fair. <laughs> Tom Hanks was always like, even in the 80s, he had 80s bod. Just, there's a different level of fitness if you go back. Look at Char Charleston Hest Heston with his shirt off and tell me that's not pudgy. <laughs> Tom Hanks has always had a dad bod. I think yeah. he was born with a dad bud. He's, he's lanky and weird, and they didn't have P90X back then. Nobody was on the keto diet. just didn't work out. <clears throat> Fitness has changed, and women have gotten hotter. <laughs> That's funny. <clears throat> so movie number nine on my list of impactful movies to my life is probably a movie that very few people have seen, and if you've seen it, you would probably disagree with me that it's a good movie. Shogun Assassin. It's, uh, it's one of those really bad Chinese, maybe Chinese, I think it's Chinese, Kung Fu movies. It had Asian people in it. it oh, I should put Rush Hour on here. It, uh, I don't, there was like three or four of them, actually, I believe. But the story is about some guy who was like, uh, a protector of the emperor or some crap and like got banished or so. I don't remember exactly, but I remember all the Kung Fu being, like, freaking ridiculous and all the like the blood was very quentin tarantino before quentin tarantino was a thing and there was this uh this fight where the guy the main character fights these three brothers who are all very specialized in a specific weapon one of them has like a, a spiked club and one of them has these wolverine looking claws i've seen this broke down a lot they all have these huge rice hats one of them has the bladed hat maybe no they're not bladed hats okay. well i mean the one with the he throws the uh, hat-like contraption over somebody and pulls the cord and it chops their head off. I don't know if that was this movie or not. I don't remember the movie spectacularly well. This sounds, this sounds trubby for a certain type of pulpy uh, kung fu, well not kung fu movie, but yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure this had all the good tropes in it. You know, where the, the Asian guys that can always jump 40 feet in the air to clear all of their enemies and run on the heads of the enemies and... All the fancy wire stuff. Man, I died laughing watching House of Flying Daggers when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Shogun Assassin is very much a lot like that. But it has really good cinematography. And uh, the, the rice hats that the three brothers had. But the reason it impacted my life is the same reason that so many other movies did. It's because as a child I watched a lot of it with my dad. And it was very much like this is how an adult male should be as a recurring theme to this whole list but no it was I, I really enjoyed the movie I need to go watch it again I probably haven't seen it in 20 years I didn't watch movies with my parents very much and they just as my example to be a man they would yell at me and tell me to stop doing that thing in particular it's <laughs> a good reason yeah well I mean you have role models in your movies that was nice it's true maybe Castaway I took too many lessons from shouldn't leave the island. You should stay on your island. 
You don't need friends. Goldeneye. It's not the best Bond film. Well, it might be. It's the best Bond film for me, for sure, 100%. Because my main media entertainment growing up was video games. Because I had divorced parents, and then when my parents remarried, their kids had divorced parents. So somebody was always getting access to the video game of the parent they weren't living with. Because if you don't have your kids, you buy them crap to earn their love. So there were video games all over the place. Not only was Ocarina of Time a huge deal growing up for me as a storyteller and just a lover of fiction, uh, but they didn't get a movie. GoldenEye had a movie, and I thought it was the best video game adapted to a movie until I realized it was the other way around, and that's why it works. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good one. Pretty Action, good one. competitiveness. I used to get kids on the block to just come up so I could destroy them in GoldenEye. It was one of my earliest, most competitive games. It was the only things I had. I didn't I didn't always beat my brothers in it. I usually didn't beat my biggest brother, Kenny, or uh, Chris. That's because Kenny would always play odd job because he's a cheater. But, like, it was just, just bonding with my stepbrothers would only happen during video games so that they could beat me in video games. Other than that, I was the stepbrother, and I needed to go away. Unfortunately for him, he's lost all that skill. And now my two-year-old son can beat him in Goldeneye. I have destroyed you, Eddie, and Zach in Goldeneye, and I will destroy anybody who comes to this garage in Goldeneye. Open it's challenge. It's a challenge. Let's do it. I ain't Thro scared of a single Throwdown. We've got it. And the movie was really dope, too. I was talking about the video game. <laughs> <laughs> got distracted. No, I loved it. I loved it. It was a, like a, the spy film that captured my mind first as far as like real espionage and going to, to go globetrotting and Hearing Russian languages spoken in a scary tone, it really opened me up to want to watch like the first Mission Impossible and Cloak and Dagger and all that stuff. It was the spy film that got me into spy films, and I do love me some spy films. Mission Impossible is not a good example of spy films, but the first one had some, some stuff. It's funny. All right, so the final list, the final movie on my list of movies that have impacted my life, and I wanted to put the series on here as well and it's one we've probably all seen uh it's the godfather and i picked that one because as again as somebody who is a hobbyist cinematographer like everything about that movie is amazing to look at so to look at the, yeah, the, the story the is good like all of the acting is top notch francis ford coppola man just yeah it's just a driving force to want, like, I wish I could make a movie that good. I don't think it's my favorite gangster movie. And I saw Goodfellas first, which really tainted it, because it was just like, it had funnier characters, I felt. Um, I'm trying to think. Well, Martin Scorsese's movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Jack Nicholson is still my favorite mm -hmm. gangster movie. I just, I can't with The Departed. Oh, right. Yeah. Now, the scene where they, they use the piano wire to strangle the dude... Which would totally cut his head off. Oh my gosh. It's just so, like, brutal. But to put that... Level, like, the acting that the, the guy did when he was dying. Like, to have that level of acting in a film is, like, unparalleled. Now. Like, nobody does that. Those dudes die in those movies. Gangster movies have the most brutal deaths. Yeah. Even when they're simple. It's just horrifying. The only movie death that I can think of that's more horrifying than that scene is uh, that, that Shia LaBeouf movie. Um, oh, when they when they killed the Indiana Jones franchise. That was a brutal death. No, well, that was <laughs> No, the, the, the Tom Hardy where they cut his throat. Yeah. Oh, and my he God. Just, he went, yeah, he went down slow. Oh, man. <laughs> he was a man about it. I like... I felt myself choking out watching both of those things happen. Just, woo! My actual favorite movie death of all time was Brad Pitt in Burn After Reading. Also, I haven't seen that movie. You know, I think it's a great movie. Uh, everyone I watch it with hates it. It's a Coen Brothers classic, but um, Brad Pitt pay plays a fitness expert working at a gym, gets manipulated into doing some low-level crimes. And he's in, uh, he, he winds up breaking into somebody's house and hiding in the closet. And he, like, the dude who comes in and finds his gun because he knows somebody broke in. 
and he's hiding in this closet, and the door opens, and he makes this stupid face to apologize, and just no frames between the door opening, and him having that stupid face, and him having a hole in his head. Just boom. That's <laughs> funny. And the comedic timing mm -hmm. is so perfect, and it's so uh, real if you're an intruder in my home, and you've hit the closet, you've messed up. So <laughs> I, I am a believer in firearms. I don't own one, but you're in the house. You, should, you should just leave, man. I might give you a chance if you're going out the window and you, and you walk away from me. But if you're in the house when I show up and I have access, you're gone. It's fair. You gotta protect my dog. So you have anybody you want to call out and have them do this? Because apparently that's a thing for this. Who cares? No. Do it if you want. You've seen it. It's fair. Mom, maybe? I don't know. I mean, it's supposed to be an Instagram thing, but again, I'm not... Cluttering up my Instagram and movie screenshots. Who are you shouting out? I don't have anybody specific to shout out. I would shout out everybody in the No Small Creator Facebook group. I'm going to share oh, this there. You guys yeah. should all, all do this. Cody Warner should do this for sure. Ryan Connolly. Ryan Connolly. Just because of movies, but in general, PewDiePie. Do this. Hashtag it. Don't forget to link back to our channel because you heard it here. It's true, PewDiePie. Just, just let's, yeah, let's... Screw, Casey Neistat. Screw Instagram. <laughs> Peter McKinnon. <laughs> we Peter McKinnon's get, all over Instagram. We want to get YouTube famous. Let's just YouTube creators all of them. I call you all out. Don't the dude forget, from Cinemassacre. Anybody who wants to... Yeah, James. Anybody who wants to link back to this video, you're challenged. You see it? You're challenged. Don't forget to put the link in the video on the front. Click. Just... Yeah. The more people we can actually challenge, the more viral potential this has. And that's all True. I care about. All right, so if you like the video, drop a thumbs up. Help us get up in the YouTube algorithm just a little bit. Also, let us know uh, in the comments what you thought of this and our lists. And, you know, maybe even leave your top ten there. Also, we upload that... this on Pornhub. We could. They're no, doing man. that now. Just let them do it. I'm not uploading this to Pornhub. Yeah, it's bad for the brand. It's true. Uh, share the video with your friends. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you can be notified. And also... Let us know if you actually enjoy this type of thing. And if you do, we'll keep doing it. If you don't, we'll probably still do it once in a while anyway. And uh, we've got an intro video that we've made for smoking cigars and having a chat anyway. So why not be stupid stuff like this? Yeah, top ten colors of duct tape. You can fight about it. You'll lose. What? Yeah. You'll Wood be... green. Mmm. Well, that's also on my list. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, that's uh, Cigar Dossier's first video on this channel with this sweet intro. Uh, this tastes like a cigar. It tastes like leaves, but decent leaves. No, it's a good one. It's not. It doesn't have a lot of character. It's not spicy. It's not leathery. It's not peppery. It's not the things I look for. It's just a good, solid, straight smoke. Uh, medium body, I guess. You call it a low body when it's not strong? Goes good with water. I call it thin. I call it a thin cigar. Skinny. Any flavor. On that note,